Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host for today's broadcast. I'm Mary Francis. And Twitter. And if at any time during our next 45 minutes, while I'm chatting with CIO John McGuthrie from Cal Poly Pomona, if you have questions or anything you would like to get into the show in terms of running it by John, please send us in a note. We're watching our feeds and we'll make sure that we get your questions in front of him. Before I get into today's broadcast, I did want to just take a moment to congratulate my colleagues here at CIO and Computer World and Network World for winning five different categories at Folio's 2019 Eddie and Ozzy Awards. For more than 25 years, these magazine industry awards have honored great design and journalistic excellence. This year attracted 2,500 entries, producing nearly 400 winners in a variety of categories. And yours truly here, CIO Leadership Live, was among those honored this year in the B2B overall video category. So an extra round of high fives is due to our intrepid video team here of directors and content producers, Ellen Fanning, Chris Hebert, and Juliet Beauchamp. Thanks for all the great work you all do. Now, moving right along, let me tell you about John. He is the VP and the CIO at California State Polytechnic University. He's been the VP and CIO at Cal Poly in Pomona, California since the summer of 2011. He and his IT staff of 130 are tasked with transforming and supporting and engaging with IT across more than 2,500 employees and 26,000 students on the Cal Poly Pomona campus. Cal Poly ranks among the top public universities on the West Coast, known for its inclusive education, the way it, it emphasizes experiential learning and innovation. The classical meaning of polytechnic is skilled in many arts. So as the website points out, there is nowhere else that students can do a variety of things such as ride an Arabian horse, practice on a Steinway Grand, bring a new product to market, and build a liquid-fueled rocket. So this is a very diverse university. Before he joined Cal Poly, John served as the CIO at both Armstrong Atlantic State University and Reinhardt College, both of those in Georgia, where he was responsible, as CIOs often are, for all the IT operations, infrastructure, networks, and telecom, uh, supporting thousands upon thousands of students. In his professional life before higher ed, John was a business process consultant for technology companies across the United States, and before that, a principal consultant for Telecordia Technologies. Welcome, John. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, let's, I, we always like to start out way above the atmosphere here at a 30,000 foot view, where we talk about the disruption that you're seeing in the higher ed industry and the kind of impact that's having uh, both on you as a CIO and on your, your board of trustees and the way the senior management at the university looks at what they're offering to students. So talk about the disruption and the things that are changing and what kind of challenges those are presenting. Yeah, so um, um, at our university, 56,000 students applied last year for approximately 7,000 spots, um, which, which means a lot of students weren't able to attend the university that wanted to attend the university. Yeah. And we are, 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 are inherently focused on ensuring that every student that comes to the university really has the right experience and we are preparing them to 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 move through the university as as efficiently as possible mm -hmm. and what we are what we are laser like focused on is is ensuring that our students can graduate in a timely manner mm -hmm. and and not only in a timely manner but that but that all of the various student groups, you know, depending on their background, depending on um, what skills they may have come with that, those students graduate at the same rate. And so we are um, um, looking closely at data. We're looking closely at how we structure and operate the university to, to make sure that each student has that, that same experience and has the same opportunity to move through the university system as mm -hmm. efficiently and as, 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 
as 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 quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. And that is that sounds like a, a broader goal for not just the IT operation, but for probably the ranks of professors, the trustees across the university. Absolutely. How, how does that specifically, you've been there eight years now, so you've seen a big change in the amount of demand and the expectation around technology as they come in. So talk a little bit about how that's been playing out. Oh, my. Well, in... in <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, that, that's, that's big. Yeah. <laughs> um, universities are kind of like cities. Yeah. So, you know, we have... Um, of, of course, all of the technology that supports the learning environment, right? And that's what most people think about when you think of universities. Mm-hmm. But we also have entertainment. We have retail. We oh. have farm operations. Yeah. We have, you have you know, campus police. You mentioned park yeah. stable. Mm-hmm. We have police, utilities. Yeah. So we have all of these things that encompass cities. And, and the students that, that come here and those that engage in the university – they're really kind of expecting to move through the system the same way that they engage with other things kind of throughout the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when, 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 I, when you think about when a student is preparing to come to the university, mm-hmm. um, they're 16 years old. They're in their high, their their bedroom at home, thinking about mm-hmm. what college is going to be like, and how right? great it's going to be to get away from their parents, <laughs> and, and how great it's going to be to get away from their parents. Yeah. Um, one of the things that they are not thinking about is engaging with administrators in the university. They're not thinking about I can't wait to talk to the. IT help desk. They're not thinking about, <laughs> I can't wait to walk into the financial aid office. And stand in line. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Line. Yeah. So so what we have to do and what we're really trying to do is to make sure that all of those kind of administrative experiences, mm-hmm. um, we can minimize um, through the use of technology, those all of the friction points as, as much as possible in the university mm-hmm. and provide students with really the the what they are thinking about when they're 16 years old, which is engaging in classes, working with other students, mm-hmm. um, and doing all the things that they think about doing. Well, and doing everything on their phones. So I would, and, and everything on their phones. I, absolutely. I would assume that has changed your mobile strategy a great deal in the last couple of years. What are some of the things you needed to do? Oh well, we um. Um, we have a bus system that, that shifts students from one part of the campus to the other part of the campus. Mm-hmm. And we had what we thought was a very, very good mobile app mm-hmm. that showed the students where the buses would be. And um, what we often do is we, we, we put students together to engage in conversations about some of the technologies that we've launched. And we showed the students, this app, and because we looked at the usage and very few students were using it. And, the, and, and they told us hmm. that it, it didn't look good, right? Oh. Um, and would, um, imagine them being honest about that. And, and, and that it didn't meet their needs because hmm. when they walked out of the class, they needed to determine which bus stop they needed to walk to in order to get to the location Oh. Where it needed to be. So oh. we asked students to redesign that mobile app, and they actually created something that looks like um, something that you would find in the market space. That would, mm-hmm. if, you, if they put in their location, it would tell them where they needed to walk to get to their closest lo- to get to their location. Interesting. By the mm-hmm. routes of the buses and yeah. students design that. And, and so students are just expecting something very, very different yeah. um, in, in terms of how they engage with the university. They're expecting to be tailored and just for them and, and, pro- and, and right. provide as yeah. much value as possible. Well, and this implies a great deal of 
organizational change inside the university with all those friendly admins that are all the people in the administrative staff that are standing by waiting to talk to these students. And we talked about this a little bit uh, when we were getting ready for this interview. And you, you said that it's been important to shift the focus from a department focused view of serving the individual students versus how they really want to interact. What have some of those challenges been? I, I didn't, you didn't just send out a note to everybody and say, here's how we're going to be working with these people now and everybody get on board because that doesn't happen, does it? <laughs> you know, when, from my first university all the way through this one, the people that work on universities, they, they do this job because they really, really enjoy engaging with students. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, I mean, their their heart is 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 helping students, and they don't like um, to think that the students don't want to come and see them. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! God. In fact, they're 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 actually bothered if a student won't come and come and see oh, them. But, okay. but that's not what the students want. So right. so what what we have to do is to is to pull the employees into the conversations that we're having with students and show them what the students want. And, mm -hmm. and if, if, if you can imagine kind of two different sets of, of students, there are, there are students that, that don't need any help, mm -hmm. right? They can, they can do everything and they can figure out everything. They read everything. They, they have someone guiding them. They don't need any help. Do they open their email? Do they read their they email? Do. A few of them, five oh. do. Yeah. <laughs> five <laughs> out of every thousand. Five. Yeah. And then we have students that that generally need a whole lot of help. So kind of the, the challenge that we need to take is the how do we help the employees separate those students? Mm -hmm. So not bother the ones that don't need help, but right. shift their right. attentions on on those that really were required just a little bit of a nudge. And mm -hmm. we can use technology to help identify who those students are. Yeah. And and then it, it makes the employee experience much better because they're engaging with students that want help, right. that want to be engaged, and they're not engaging with students that mm -hmm. are not left alone. Now, how do you go about doing that? Does that end up being a lot of just one-on-one -on -one conversations that you have to have with, like, department chiefs and that sort of thing? It's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, a lot of, of educating, but but luckily the market, the world is doing this, right? The world is, 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 is moving digital. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can point to, um, because almost everything that we do inside the university, someone is doing something very similar in the market space. Right. right. And so when, when it comes to moving people across the campus, someone is doing that. When it comes to providing end user support for a particular service, someone mm -hmm. is doing that. When mm -hmm. it comes to, um, um, financial aid, um, uh, that ends up looking very much like a bank. Someone is doing that. So we can point to different industries and yeah. point to different models that are working and say, let's move just a little bit closer mm -hmm. to those models. And one of the other things that we've done is we, we've created a, a, um, a, a scale that, 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 that is, is on a continuum for moving from a very manual service to an automated service. So okay. a, a manual service me, me, meaning is that is, is it defined, right? The idea, the whole concept of a student going to pick up their ID card. And filling right? out forms and turning them into someone at a desk. Yeah, that kind of thing. And so at the very, very beginning of that, is there a process, Yeah. right? Is it documented? Is it, is it written down someplace um, all the way through to, is there a system that supports that process? Mm -hmm. this, and is then your, you know, this is your background as a business process consultant, rearing yeah, its head, I, isn't it? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it, 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 it pops up every now and then. It does, I imagine so. And then all the way down to not needing any individuals engage in that process. Mm -hmm. Now it's completely enabled by AI. It's completely automated. It predicts when someone may need help. Yeah. And, and so what we're trying to do with, with, with the, the folks across the university is not move everything to an AI model so that no people are involved because we don't need to be there. And, 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 and frankly, I don't think it fits every place, but mm -hmm. provide the, 
different organizations the opportunity to say, this is where we need to be. Yeah. And if this is where we need to be, we can help you get there. Mm -hmm. um, um, what we don't ever want to do is to make that decision for the various offices across the campus, right? right. That, that it shouldn't be up to us to say, you should be AI enabled. And oh, by the way, John's going to come help you. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, universities are, uh, I think, still uh, very famous for how democratically the processes all run. I mean, nobody, oh, yeah. nobody gets to be the university king, even the, you know, like the, the, the top, the top dog at the university <laughs> doesn't get that. And, you know, this ties into, uh, we've already gotten two questions from our audience for you, John. And one of them is about how you identify future leaning technologies. And of course, you've already mentioned AI, artificial intelligence, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how you've turned that into a bot and the yep. use that everybody gets out of that one. But how do you and your staff go about keeping an eye out for these future leaning technologies? Um, luckily, um, um, we're, we're actually in a university and we have some very, very, very smart people. And we engage um, um, with, with industry, we engage with our faculty, we engage with staff. We're we're always participating in conferences, so we're we're always kind of in, in engaged in the world to try to figure out what mm -hmm. should we be doing. Um, um, every every morning, I, I have a regimen, and I and I, I I try to get my staff to read as much as possible. Mm -hmm. but, but I, I I scan three newspapers. Um, I read journals while while I'm have, with coffee and my. Mm -hmm. And my egg whites, because yes. I'm, I'm oh. trying to I keep my cholesterol down, and 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 so, but I, I try to get my staff and and myself. We read and we ingest as much information as possible, mm -hmm. and then we just try to figure out well, what's the most appropriate technologies to bring into the university, right. and and when is it a, appropriate to introduce it to the university? Yes. Well, and related to that one, there was another question about whether the university system makes use of ITSM, uh, IT service management um, software, and what kind of value does that extract? And that's something that probably students wouldn't see, but your IT staff would. Yes, we, we do take full advantage of, mm -hmm. of ITSM software. In fact, the, the concepts and the, the methodologies that we use in ITS, ITSM for our, our IT organization, we're actually bringing that to other parts of the university mm -hmm. that are not IT focused. And so we, we've, you know, um, um, IT organizations um, for a long time have, have been supporting end users. Yes. And, and IT organizations are, for the most part, experts at doing that yes and so we're bringing that knowledge to other organizations to say you know uh, this is how you you track tickets this is how you engage with customers this is how you 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 identify um, um, what you're doing and what you could be doing better and we're trying to bring those same methodologies that we have inside of this organization mm -hmm. again throughout the entire university great well, and we have an we have another question that is um, uh, again related to this. People are paying attention. Uh, do you have a blueprint or a strategy that helps you as you move digitally? And of course, we talked about this. Digital transformation is happening in every industry across every industry, and yeah. it, and so. But every industry has a different flavor of it. So, yes. how does that? What does that look like for Cal Poly? Um, for us. Um, Initially, um, going digital was like pushing a rope up a hill, right? And so um, I, I, I remember three years ago, three or four years ago, I was, I was at a conference, um, met a, a, a fantastic individual. Mm -hmm. um, he shared with me his book, and I read the book, and I thought, we have to do this. Uh, and I, I bought all the administrators um, um, this particular book, um, asked them to read it, and I thought we were going to have these great conversations and we were going to make the university digital. Uh -huh. Six months later, um, I'm still trying to get that mile-long rope and push it up the hill. Mm -hmm. 
You, maybe uh, you should have provided an executive summary. Yeah. You wanted everybody to read a whole book, right? <laughs> um, but, but now I'm no longer trying to convince the rest of the university that we need to be digital. Okay. Um, the, 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 again, the market space is doing this. Yes, um, yeah. everyone the world is, around us is going that way. It's, yeah. Absolutely. So now it's how do we prioritize our initiatives? Mm -hmm. um, 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 it's do we make the horse stables digital or, or do we, end? Or yes. do we, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so every, so again, we don't have to try to sell people to, mm -hmm. to on this now. It's now how do we make good decisions with the resources that we have yeah. to get the best impact? Um, for the university. Mm -hmm. Well, and along those lines, let's talk about uh, AI initiatives, because yeah. if anything has been the darling, uh, certainly on the tech media side, it's been AI and robotic process automation, and some of it is is quite technical and deep within the stacks at, at most businesses, uh, nonprofit as well as private. But um, the AI initiatives and the way they change the way people view technology um you've got the billy chat bot talk about yeah. billy chat yes <laughs> starting so, with how it got named for that <laughs> no, i i do i i was not in the room when <laughs> when when billy chat was named so i i, I was not part of that conversation okay. but, but but i am proud of i am proud of, of yes of yes me. i know i know it's a great it's a great little bot and so tell, yes, tell it, me why it, so so when and I'm 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 going to talk about my son. He was, he he went to he went to this institution um, when he started when he was 17. Yeah. Um, if you were to hand him a piece of paper that had all of the facts that he needed to know about the university, mm -hmm. um, and he was an excellent student, he would have taken the piece of paper, read the title, and said, "I'm going to put it in my notebook and I'll read it later." And then when it came time for him to uh, make a decision that was based off of what was on that piece of paper, mm -hmm. he would probably not find the paper, go to the website, try to Google it, and try to figure out what the answer is. And right. so I have, a, I have a feeling that a lot of 17-year-olds, you know, if, if anyone in the audience has, has a 17-year-old, they're, they're probably pretty yeah. similar to that. Yes. So what we found is that is that by providing a very easy mechanism for those 17 year olds to, to ask a question mm -hmm. and to ask a question about the things that um, um, we would like to provide them on that one sheet of paper. Like right. when is the time to register? Um, um, when, when do you, when do when classes do you, start? <laughs> you know, when do you sign up for your residence halls? You know, all right. the, the, and so over this past year, right, we, we've had, um, and we, we're just uh, trialing this with freshmen. We've had over a hundred thousand questions sent to Billy Chat, and the students can send a text message, and, and Billy Chat will answer. And and if Billy Chat can't answer, it'll forward that question to someone that to a human that that can. So right, the right. students are very interested to try to figure out well where is this Billy Chat person and. And or how many <laughs> people are there, and why are they working so late? And so. and nobody's tried to hack Billy Chat yet. And not that we know of. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're braced for that. In fact, we'll talk a little bit about your security operations center, which is all student yeah. run in a moment as well. Um, so Billy Chat launched about a year ago. Uh, uh, almost a year ago, okay. it came with, with 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 this incoming freshman class. And so, so we, we started it over the summer just before they, just, just before they started. And it has been a phenomenal success. Mm -hmm. um, and Great. so it's really causing us to rethink how we provide information to students. Okay. Because uh, it, it, um, I, I used to think that we would have these, these, these great information portals where students would log in find the information that they need and use say, the search engine, all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. 
my son was really going to do that. So, nope, so. nope exactly. It's like we can learn a lot <laughs> watching <laughs> the young and the way they move in the world. Um, and we actually, we probably need a whole lot more of that. Well, we have questions pouring in. Um, this latest one is from a 1992 CPP alum. So oh. he says, he says, hi, John, um, and wants to know, he says, with more than, with about 26,000 enrollment and tons of endpoints, how is your technology team handling security from these thousands of endpoints that are gaining access everywhere? So how do you secure the IT environment? And I just mentioned your student-run uh, security ops center. So let's let's segue over to that and talk about yes, a bit well, about that. We... Um we have um, 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 engaged students to help us um, run security for mm -hmm. the university. Mm -hmm. And, and um, um, uh, how do we do it? We, we have a lot of procedures. Um, that doesn't uh, sound very exciting, John. A lot of no, procedures. No. no. Well, 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 if someone wants to know how do we secure, well, it's, it's in order to bring up a service on campus, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're talking about the least exciting pieces this, of how we run the business the process automation stuff. Again, Absolutely. Huh? Mm -hmm. Very procedural. It takes, you know, um, um, a, a long time to bring up a service. There are, there are lots of checks. There's, 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 and everything has to be brought up so that it can be monitored out of our security operations. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, um, get, how do we, how do we do it? Um, we, we do it with, with, uh, again, procedures. Mm -hmm. We do it with, with, with a lot of care, with a lot of, of, of very focused intention. And what we, what we do is also, we, we have a lot of separation in, in our environment. Mm -hmm. So okay. people see you, you have 26,000 students um, and and how do you secure your 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 core system from 26,000 students? So mm -hmm. it's 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 almost like we have a public Internet operating on campus. So right. Right. and then we have areas where not all 26,000 students can in, can engage. Okay. So we have different tiers yeah. and to be in certain components of the network most students can't operate in that space. So what we really have to secure mm -hmm. is, is a much smaller footprint. So Now, and that, um, the Security Operations Center, which is student-run and there are professors linked to it, uh, there's also some external funding that helps put that up. Is that essentially your cybersecurity operation, or do you have another <laughs> set of cybersecurity folks who are part of IT and not in that special building? That's a separate, well, okay. well, we, we we have this very very special building, mm -hmm. right? And, and we we took all of our IT security professionals, and we placed them in one facility. Mm -hmm. And and we placed them in one facility because um, um, we wanted to separate um, the operations from from information security. Mm -hmm. But we had all this extra space in 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 this building. So what we did was we went and engaged with faculty that had research in the information security space. And so if they had an external grant or if they had external funding, they could move those projects into that facility. Mm -hmm. So some of those projects are student focused. Mm -hmm. Some of them are based off of, of public and private grants. Right. Um, and but what we've what we've been able to do is we now have a facility that has students, it has faculty, and it has our IT staff all focused on information security, all working in one space. And in that there is mm -hmm. a student run SOC mm -hmm. where they actually monitor the student run data center. Okay. So and so they're responsible for that. And, but what we do is is that the the tools that they run, use to run that SOC are the same tools that we run in our IT security operations center for yes. the for the campus. Right. So we end up bringing those students after they've operated in 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 in, in, in that student SOC, we bring them over to work in mm -hmm. our, our own facility. Sounds and, like and, and they're all they're all 
they're all trained on the tools and you already know how they work. It sounds like you've built up a little bit of an unfair advantage for yourself in terms of hiring security talent in your area. I mean, you're in Southern California and it can't be easy. (laughs) Well, we've actually decided that we, there are certain skill sets Mm -hmm. that we can't keep for very long. Okay. And so, what are those? Uh, name the name um, a few of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, skill sets that are for information security, um, skill sets that work on 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 some very um, commonly known high-profile um, platforms, mm-hmm. um, and and we have been very intentional at at moving students um, into these roles. And hiring these students, and often they they'll come work for us after they graduate, they earn their master's degree, and then after they earn their master's degree, they'll leave the university. And so we're very intentional about using them while they're here, and yeah. taking full advantage of the skills that they bring to the university, but not trying to compete with them with the rest of Southern California. Right. Right. So, so if we just decide that you know it's our intention to keep them. Two years as a student, mm-hmm. three years after they graduate, and yeah. then we launch them into the world. There we and go. Then and you it tell hurts. them, and you tell yeah. them, don't forget where you came from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, come back to us again someday. And there's another question from uh, our listeners about the implementation of the bots of the Billy Chat and how that impacted user satisfaction KPIs. And then how did you handle the business change around that? Because that was, uh, that went to that issue you mentioned about the admins really wanting the students to come and see them, but I imagine well, everybody found plenty of other things to do. But tell me what the impact was. One, um, that wasn't something that I had to push, and I oh, was nice. I was in the process of trying to figure out how do I approach this particular organization, and we were looking at their call logs, mm-hmm. and we thought, how do we convince them? that they need to do this yeah and they knocked on my door and said john we really want to do this will you help us great and i thought i thought hmm, doesn't get much better I'm than that think about this for a while <laughs> let's, let's see if this is the right thing to do for the university so yeah so so that was that was that was great and so what has now happened as a result of that is other groups on campus can't wait to be ai enabled Oh, because cool. they mm-hmm. they see one they had no idea that 100 over 100,000 questions would be asked yeah. in a short period of time mm-hmm. and and so everyone sees the opportunity and when you when you again when you think about um, if you can take all of those questions that someone it's just oh by the way how do you do this and yeah. you can answer them and then focus again all your attention on those students that really need help. Mm-hmm. It really changes the work environment. Yeah. So. And and literally in this case, seeing was believing. Oh yeah. And thought, oh yeah. And this so is, now they're pulling me up the hill with that rope and I'm yes. I'm, I'm 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 no longer pushing. Well, and that's such a better position for a CIO, isn't it? When you can be responding to the pull rather than pushing that rock up the hill (laughs) over and over, (laughs) over and over again. Um, One of the things I wanted to definitely get to, uh, one more question from our group. You had mentioned a book that you were trying to get everybody to read, and I should have followed up on this too. What was the title of it? Do you remember? Um, It was the George Westerman book. uh, Oh, um, Digital Strategy? I believe I believe it's something like that. Going Digital? Yes, I know the one you mean. It was out, I think, two or three years ago. Correct. Yes. And it was funny. I had lunch with him. I missed his talk. He's I had wonderful. lunch with him, mm-hmm. and he was telling me about the book, and I yeah. thought, "This is it. fantastic. This is perfect. Everybody should read this." And he didn't even tell me he he didn't tell me he wrote the book uh-huh. until after he gave it to me, and then he said, "Here, here's the book," and I said, "That's oh. you." So, How well, modest! How modest! <laughs> you're uh, you're you're right that everyone should read it. It's one of the seminal texts, I think, on going digital. Um, but it's just everything is going to be in that whole realm of digital transformation. Everything is so much a point in time. You know, this, the, this, the stuff that was brilliant two years ago is probably different now. And the, and the concepts that he talks about, about consolidating systems, yes. focusing on platforms, it yep. all needs to be part of the strategy. And when I read that book, it just really, it just mm-hmm. made me think about the world and just 
it just, so many different it, ways. It, it gelled for you. Um, yeah, it, well, and let's talk a little bit about managing all of this change in this move to the digital world, because uh, I've, I've got two angles on this. One is that you've had a personal leadership practice for the last yes. several years, where yes. every couple of years, you essentially, you fire yourself and you rehire yourself to give yourself a, a yes. fresh point of view. And that, that that's, no one else has to do that for me. So. That's nice. Well, <laughs> eight years in, you're already three years past the average lifespan of a CIO in any job. Our hmm. state of the CIO research that we do, I know, don't tell anybody, but our state of the CIO research that we uh, do, it will come out again, the, the next, the 2020 version is out in January, but it we track the tenure, the average tenure of CIOs, and it has been a little more than five years for, for a while now, um, but here you are at eight years, so you're, you're in that like longevity stretch that we think of for CIOs, so I want you to talk about how you fire yourself and rehire yourself and then the the latest the latest outcome from that was the way you have changed the way you've got IT structured and it affected your IT funding model and all of that. So take that away. So the um, all of the things that um, that I'd look back on that were my successes. Mm-hmm. Right? Anything that I that I did right or, or even the things that did not work. And that I might want to avoid in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, what I try to do is to not rest on those assumptions for very long. Okay. And so I intentionally decide that I'm going to forget about those. I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go out and I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to um, understand what's going on in the market space. I'm going to understand what's going on on campus, mm-hmm. and I'm going to build a whole new set of assumptions and just forget about what what worked so you've and, you figured out a way to essentially arrive at your job like a new CIO coming in would absolutely that has, absolutely that has to Over take a lot time. of that has to take a, a lot of mental discipline I'm impressed it, 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 it drives my staff nuts they're oh. like oh gosh he's not he's wearing the blue suit again he's oh, oh no he's applied for his own job we are in such trouble now <laughs> And, and so what that has led to is, is we're now moving to a very different model mm-hmm. for how we deliver and partner with our colleges. And we, we have eight different colleges. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first arrived at the university, the university was very decentralized. Each college had their own IT staff. Um, the budget um, was, you know, the state funding was down, the economy was down, yeah. everything was consolidation, everything was focused on how do we drive cost out. Who can you lay uh, off? How do we save money? What can you consolidate? Right. Yep. Doom, gloom. And, oh, no. and, uh, Not that, fun for CIOs anywhere. No. 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 And, you know, and it was, it was, you know, I had some very difficult conversations that I did not have to have, but I thought I would have to have yeah. when I moved to California. And it would be wrong of me to continue with this position with those assumptions, right? Mm. And the assumptions that drove the organizational structure today that mm. we have, um, um, some of those assumptions still live. So it was mm. time for me to go back and kind of rethink reevaluate and just start from scratch. So what we're doing now is we're not decentralized. We're not going to take and, and move people organizationally, but we are going to functionally place people in colleges so that they can have a closer working relationship because I, I want the colleges to have more say on the IT staff that are supporting them. I want them, them to be able to set their priorities. It develops them, more personal relationships with the business and with IT on both sides. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm IT support at home. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm a real bad <laughs> IT support at home. Right? When my wife can get me off the sofa. But she doesn't fire me because yeah. I think I'm part of the family. So yeah, she keeps you, me. You live there. I, She's stuck with you, essentially. <laughs> and, but I'm part of the family. So I yeah. want to make the different... The, the people that we're placing in the college is part of that college family, right? Okay. I want to make mm-hmm. them feel like they're part of a college. I want them to operate with the same, in the same structure. I want them to have the same methodologies. I want mm-hmm. them to have 
the same procedures, but I want them to be part of that family. And so mm -hmm. we're now shifting to say to, to move the funding and I want each college to help me determine what resources, what projects, and I don't want them all centrally managed. I want them college managed. And, and so mm -hmm. I want the people operating as, as a, again, part of the colleges, mm -hmm. which is, which is going to shift the way we fund IT resources. Cause now right. if the, if the college wants to pursue something, um, I want to help them get more IT people. Okay. Right? And those IT people are going to support them. Mm -hmm. So I want I want them to to take their arm and put their arm and yeah walk with me. You know, let right, let's right. walk this way and then let's have that funding discussion because this is what you need to accomplish what you need to yeah. get done. And it's no longer John. I need you to do this for me. This is John. Let's figure out together how we can get the resources so that this, we can accomplish yeah. it. Now, I assume before you rolled this out, you had the, the president and the trustees and all the different, your eight colleges, you've got everybody bought in. That's a yes. big, it's a big governance change, isn't it, in the funding it, model it, as well? It, what, was, what was funny was that the, the colleges were very excited about this. Oh, right? neat. And, but then when I, when I brought this to the senior IT team, mm -hmm. they looked at me and thought, why are we doing this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, You'll this find out soon enough, guys. <laughs> this isn't who we are. No. I, said, no. I, said, I said, oh. But and so I, I, I asked them to, to kind of, I, I engaged them to say, create a model. Because yep. I, I laid out the concept. I said, create a model that doesn't work. And, and we spent about 45 minutes discussing um, um, kind of the pros and cons. And they kept saying, John, this is just not right. And mm -hmm. I finally had to explain to them that we're doing this. Right? Yeah. And, and, and this, this is, is now This our. is the bus. You need to get on the yeah. bus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is, and, it, and the bus, is, you can hear the is getting ready to pull off. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. and you, you're working now with an IT budget of about, you said, 1.7, 1.8 million. About and, 17 uh, Oh, I'm sorry, 17 million. That, that yeah. Typical editor getting the decimal point in the wrong place. So sorry, 17 you, million. You one more point, too, in, in the other direction. Now, does it? that mean that – I know. Wouldn't that be nice? Huh? Let's make that 170 yeah. million. Does that mean that the individual colleges will now essentially have technology earmarked funds, or do they need to come up with that from somewhere else? So um, they have – technology earmarked funds okay. and what used to happen is that they used to invest those, they invest those funds centrally and they, they mm -hmm. still do. but but now they're in a position to actually be more flexible for the additional funds that they request okay because they weren't really they didn't really have the flexibility to request additional people mm -hmm. right they could uh, they could actually make requests for additional services and, and, and projects and try to get them funded. But, but it was they complicated were, for how we were tied into that. And they were competing with everybody else who needed more resources as well. Yeah, this is absolutely. interesting. Now, this kind of thing, and I know your background is a business process guy. I know that you have metrics that you probably have to put in place. for it. Give us an example of one of the ways you will measure how successful this is. Um, I'm just assuming you're going to be a huge success on this. I am. I am. Well, the, the old John is thinking this is like mm -hmm. horrible. The new John <laughs> is. is the new John's work. all charged up and excited. Okay. Um, we, we have some, some metrics that the university uses to gauge how we're, and, and again, this goes back to that first conversation in terms of student mm -hmm. success, right? In terms of how are we graduating students are we eliminating what we call achievement gaps, meaning sure that all students can, can graduate at the same rate? And so by doing this, one of the things that I want to be able to do, because all of the colleges need data, right? Mm -hmm. They all have solutions. They have you know, different projects, but they're all kind of uh, revolving around the data and how well they're moving their colleges forward. Mm -hmm. So the mark of success will be, is if, if the colleges can actually graduate students at a faster pace oh, and they deliver programs okay. um, the way that they want to deliver their programs. And again, not have IT in the way. And so mm -hmm. 
if, if, if we're all focused and what we call this is student success, right? Yep. We're all focused yep. on student success. And the, the IT metrics shouldn't be IT metrics. Mm -hmm. We should be, how are we contributing? And that's why you want to put the resources in the college. Yes. How, how, colleges. How are we contributing to student success? Mm -hmm. That's great. And if it's far away inside the IT division, mm -hmm. it's really hard to measure. Yeah. If it's close and the colleges can say, I need these resources and they were to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. Right. And it becomes part of their metrics. Right. Right. These aren't these aren't IT metrics in terms of how long it takes us to support an end user, how long it takes us to deploy our desktop solution. These are these this are university wide metrics. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we're going to have the biggest impact. OK, excellent. Well, you will be amazed to find that our 45 minutes has flown by here. Oh, um, <laughs> I know. I know. And you, you were a little you were thinking you wouldn't have a great time. <laughs> Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you, I always like to finish off with one great piece of leadership advice for other CIOs or for IT leaders who are coming up that arc toward being CIOs themselves. What have you found is just other than firing yourself and rehiring yourself every couple of years and giving yourself fresh eyes on what's happening, what have you found has worked best for you as a leader? Um, for me, it's... One, um, own your time. Yes. Um, don't, do not let anyone else own your time. You have to own it. Um, and I, I think the second um, is, is more around ensuring that you own your commitments. Mm -hmm. um, there was one position that I was, that I was uh, close to taking one time. Yes. And they had all these commitments laid out. Um, and, and I thought, and so I, I asked during one of the, one of the conversations, are these going to be my commitments or are these your commitments? Mm -hmm. And they told me that these are your commitments. Oh, and I thought, yeah, this mm -hmm. is probably not the right opportunity for me. Right. I, I want to be, I want to have some influence and some ownership mm -hmm. on what I commit to. And I want to be able to know that if I say this is going to happen, yeah. I really believe, you know, within within the you know deepest components of my heart that it's mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Excellent. And so, so mm -hmm. owning your time and own, owning your commitment. Okay, very good advice. Very good advice. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure <laughs> having you on here. We learned so much about Cal Poly Tech and all kinds of great things. I look forward to our next time we talk. You'll be telling me how that's all going with the IT scattered out among the eight different colleges and how much happier you use the base is, right? We're going go, <laughs> we're gonna go into this assuming it's going to work out great. <laughs> so, Absolutely. All I, right. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, John. It was a pleasure having you here. If you joined us late into the broadcast, please feel free to watch the full episode later today on CIO.com or on YouTube, or listen to the audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And please join me for our next episode, which will be streamed live, as today's was, on LinkedIn and Twitter and YouTube. And that will be on Monday, November 18th at 12 noon Eastern, when I'll be joined here in the studio by Richard Wiedenbeck, who is the CIO of Emeritus. And I will just wrap up by urging you to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, which is IDG Tech Talk Live, where you can find all the previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live. And thanks so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure having you here and talking with John McGuthrie from Cal Poly Pomona. And I hope you'll join us again next time. Take care. <laughs>